I'd like to welcome you. What a great turnout. Give yourself a big hand. Welcome to our over 40-year uh, Holy Week tradition. None of us remember when it started. I, I, I started it back in 1876, but, uh, but I've, things are a little hazy. First Central, First Baptist, St. Paul Methodist, and Highland Church host each day this week. But we are really aware that this is bigger than just our four churches. This is something that's very important to our city, and uh, it's in our traditions and who we are as Abilinians and how our, our faith traditions uh, reach over to others. And uh, it's, it's a magnificent thing for, for all of us. Well, for many years we shared a catered lunch and uh, then COVID uh, ruined that. And, and now last year we did a dessert and I think that works just as, just as good. So uh, we're happy about that. First Central, I just got to tell you, our church um, is the sweetest church, <laughs> and we have the best desserts. Well, uh, uh, that is to say, uh, now it's up to the other churches to prove us wrong. I'm announcing today that this is the final four for desserts. <laughs> So far, the chocolate pie is the number one pick. Let's see you uh, uh, outdo that. May the games begin. <laughs> now, right at the get-go, we want to think in advance about all those who make this possible, the teams of folks that put this together, clean up, and all four of our churches. Let's in advance give them a big hand. preacher today is from First Baptist Church, Brandon Hudson. We welcome Brandon and his wife, Jill, and if they'd both stand. You probably know all the good stuff about Brandon. Uh, Lubbock grown, came here from Birmingham, outstanding preacher, committed pastor, incredibly smart, personable, and wonderfully relational. At least this is what Bob Ellis told me to say. <laughs> and he's right. But uh, it's my job to uh, 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 speak about some of the things that Bob didn't tell me. Uh, so. <laughs> I want to cut through all this stuff and tell you the backstory about Brandon. Like the fact that in high school he finished second in the state of Texas in debate twice. The backstory is that his wife, Jill, won first. <laughs> Jill is a seminary graduate. I think she has more degrees than, than Brandon. She is beginning today a position as coordinator of Texas Baptist Women in Ministry. All three of them. <laughs> That's a Presbyterian joke. <laughs> Brandon got his first degree from Texas Tech. Uh, to tell you how intelligent Brandon is, he squeezed a four year college education into five. <laughs> Obviously not a math major. He told me he changed his majors five times. In fact, he debated majoring in debate, and he lost that debate. <laughs> Before he became a preacher, he taught writing at a community college, he told me, where he focused, well, because he didn't have many customers, he focused mostly on crossword puzzles, waiting for students to come who wanted help writing their emails. <laughs> Now, right at the get-go, we want to thank in advance. Oh, I already did that part. Where, where's my second page? <laughs> I know I had some more good stuff, but it, it's gone. It's on page four. <laughs> We're happy to welcome you to uh, uh, our Holy Week series. And it's not just for fun that we get together. We're... Uh, commencing on Holy Week, this journey of Jesus to the cross, 
and we want to take seriously, and believe you me, we're going to, uh, this, this walk we have before us. So I, I call us now to worship God. Let's stand and sing together our first hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. giving God you provide for us in many ways that we cannot begin to even count. We're here in your presence again this week, looking for answers to questions that challenge our lives. How is it that those who we love become ill and frail? How can we manage the simple everyday details of living that seem to elude our control? We pray that those gathered here experience joy in their life but this is, doesn't always happen that way. And so we bring these questions, these life challenges to you and place them at your feet with a prayer that our lives might be turned through, around through our faith in you, that we might finally find peace and hope. Give us grace as we approach you that we might be uplifted in your presence, just as Martha was reassured by the words of Christ as she anointed his feet with oil so we find comfort in your constant presence and your creation that surrounds us. Your love for us is sweet, like a sweet perfume that is always awaiting us, filling our lives and sustaining us in times of trouble. Uphold us this day, we ask, O Lord, and in the days ahead. For you've created us 
to delight in you, to lay ourselves at your feet. We pray, O oh God, that we, that will be our experience. And for this, we sing our praise to you today, delight in, in your presence. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading is from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And since a Baptist is preaching today, I figured in true Baptist tradition, we should all stand for the scripture reading. So please stand for the reading of John chapter 12. I was a Baptist before Presbyterian, so I know. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray Jesus, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's, a, it's worth a year's wage. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus replied, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
remember First Baptist, you know I'm only batting about 75% for remembering to turn my microphone on. Before I talk. So it's passing, but it's not great. It is a joy to be here with you, and I loved that version of Come Out Fountain. That was amazing, and it's particularly perfect for Holy Week. It was somber, right? I mean, sometimes we sing that song, it's very upbeat, and it resolved in this kind of beautiful, positive moment. I I'm not a musician, so I can just tell you how I feel about it. It felt sad for a little bit, and then it felt happy. And that's kind of Holy Week, right? This is not a week full of joy in the expected ways, and yet it ends with an empty tomb. And that's the amazing part. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, for the gift of this day and this community, I give you thanks. For the gift of the voices of children in the midst of this room, I give you thanks. Like spring, it reminds us that life bursts forth in unexpected ways. I thank you for this legacy of community, and I pray that throughout this week, we would be invigorated and enriched as we walk with Jesus towards the cross, and ultimately, as we view the tomb that is empty and Jesus loosed upon the world. Now, may we reflect well on this story, and through these words, or in spite of them, may you be glorified, and may our hearts be transformed. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I had to give it a little bit. I, I give a very non-Baptist ending to most of my prayers. So, as Carlo was saying, you know, we've got to keep it even. <laughs> it is a joy to be here. I love what you do here. I love that you've been doing this since 1876. <laughs> so Cliff at one point told me it actually started with the Pilgrims. That they, they landed on the rock and then they immediately came to Abilene. They're like, let's find a place that's not so wet. Can we get somewhere? It's a little drier. We love these small trees. Let's go there. <laughs> and when they came, because the Puritans were all, also known for being really embracing of other, uh, you know, denominations, right? That's, they never burned anybody at the stake. So um, they were like, let's get together and, and, and celebrate the differences. By the way, they did burn people at the stakes, and they didn't celebrate differences. Just a few weren't alive back then like Cliff was. <laughs> I hear I have a rich uh, legacy of ribbing between Cliff and Phil Christopher that I have to live into, and so I want to start strong. <laughs> when I had the opportunity, Cliff called together me and Shane and Benji, and we talked about this week. And I was like, that's great, I'm very excited. And then the next thing I know, there were only two times left to pick from to preach. And it was either last or first. And I thought the first shall be last, except this time. <laughs> the first shall be first. I love this idea that we get together, and this year in particular, in particular we have this theme of a week called Holy, and over the next four days, we're going to be walking through John's story of what's happening as Jesus enters Jerusalem on this week called Holy. And so we start today with this beautiful story of fragrance. And I titled this sermon, because Cliff was insistent about having one, Uth <laughs> Day Worship, because I wanted to be able to make that noise in front of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> It is a story about fragrance. It's a diatribe against Judas. You know, I love what John does here. We're just walking through this story. Before we get back to the part where we're talking about what's actually happening in the room, Judas does this thing that we need to talk about, about taking the money, and he's upset. But in case you didn't get who Judas was, John wants you to clearly understand he's a rascal, right? It's not enough that you're going to see him betray Jesus in a few days. John wanted you to know he was a thief. It's almost like he was John's worst enemy. And so every chance John had in the gospel to be like, oh yeah, that guy is a loser, he pointed it out. 
It's like if you were in high school and we were writing about our rivals, right? And every story we tell about our high school experience, even though our rivals were probably just doing normal things, when we tell stories, we're like, that guy was a real loser, right? <laughs> Here's what's amazing, and I do want to point this out. No matter how much John says about Judas, and no matter how much Judas will betray Jesus, I do want us to remember that Jesus will serve Judas in the upper room. Even the one, even when we are at our worst and seeking to betray the God we love, we are still welcome to the table and our feet are still washed by our Lord and Savior. So no matter what John says here, it didn't affect the way Jesus treated Judas. So let us be careful in how we treat those that we view as our enemies. Okay, enough about Judas. We won't talk about him again. Unless I do, and then we will. <laughs> so right before this story, we've had a story some of you probably heard. Uh, I know in our church we did, and probably your other churches, if you've been following along with John's Gospel. We had this beautiful story of the resurrection of Lazarus, right? And so I want us to, to, to really recognize the irony, because kind of the tail end of the story of Lazarus is that when Jesus calls him out, Martha says, hang on a second, he's going to smell really bad. And one of the things that is prominent in this story is how good the room smelled. That's not on accident. John is writing with a theological depth and an artfulness that we're called to pay attention to. This Jesus who encountered the stench of death is now on his way to his own death, surrounded with the fragrance of worship. And that's what we're doing here today, by the way. How many of you had something else you could be doing right now? How many of you are good at wasting time? Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now, it is okay to waste time. Because if you think about it, on Sunday morning when we're in worship, or any time that we're reading scripture, or we're praying, or we're devoting ourselves to something larger than ourselves, or we are feeding the poor, or we are caring for our neighbors, any time we are doing something out of the generosity of Christ in our hearts, we are doing something that if we were just measuring by efficiency, we could be doing something better. We could be doing something different. The reason I love Mary in this story is it fits with the other accounts we have of who Mary is, and that is Mary is happy to be at the feet of Jesus. And if you'll note, so is Lazarus, right? He just got brought back from the dead, and what is he doing? He's spending his time wisely, hanging out with Jesus. He's lounging at the table. He's relaxing. John doesn't get into the Mary-Martha dynamic that some of the other Gospels do, where we have to, are you a Mary living in a Martha world kind of moment, right? It's a great book title, I'm sure it sold well. Every time I talk about this in churches I've served in the past, people come up to me, afterwards, men and women, and say, oh man, I really didn't like that because you were calling out Martha, or I really didn't like that because you called Mary lazy. And I never called Mary lazy. She was efficient with her use of time, right? People get really identified with how we spend our time. That's why when we meet people for the first time, what do we often ask? What do you do? Because apparently we believe that the thing you do for money is the thing that makes you a human. <clears throat> Maybe we ought to ask questions like, what do you actually care about? Because you may not care about selling insurance. You may. It may be your calling. It may be a thing that brings you meaning. You may not care about checking groceries out. You may not care about that. You may be doing that as a means to another end. But instead, when we meet people, the number one question, and I'm guilty of this, we ask is, what do you do? Or if you're retired, which some of you, just by looking, may be. Okay? <laughs> it's cool. <clears throat> what did you do? What a horrible question. Like, just because you're retired, you can't do something? <laughs> it's in the past tense? 
We ask these questions like, what do you do? Because we live in a culture that is dominated by efficiency and production. How many widgets did you put out today? What's the bottom line? But this is a story that our bottom line, for followers of the way of Jesus, particularly in a week called Holy, is not about the grades you make, because I mean, that's something y'all are facing and many of us are not, right? I get that. Are y'all excited about summer? Anybody got any finals coming up? Do you have a final for choir? Last Saturday night. <laughs> so instead of Saturday night special, you got a Saturday night final. <laughs> we live in a world that thrives on pressure and on what we can bring to the system. But on this week called Holy, let's remember that our number one calling is to be at the feet of Jesus. To waste our time. That's what Mary does. She takes not only her time, where she could have been helping Martha serve, she takes not only her time, but she also takes a very expensive fragrance. Let's be honest, nard is a funny word, right? <laughs> you can just see siblings saying to one another, you're such a nard. <laughs> Don't be like that. She takes this expensive prominent, fragrant perfume, and she puts it on the feet of Jesus. And for a woman in the first century, she takes the thing that is her shining glory, this most sacred thing, and she uses it to wipe his feet. And Jesus gets it. She is anointing him for burial. Jesus gets it and receives it and honors it. And he does the same for us. When we take our time to come to Holy Week lunches, when we take our time to serve the poor, and we'll come to that briefly in a second, when we take our time to care for the lost and the last and the least, to celebrate those who are shunned by the system, to find the face of Jesus in our enemies, we are honoring Jesus, and our worship is fragrant. As we enter this week of holy love, let me stop. Let's talk about the poor always being with us. This is a line that's often been used to say we don't really need to deal with that, right? Sometimes people have used this line to say poverty is such a large issue that even Jesus said well, it'll always be around. But you notice Jesus didn't say don't mess with it, right? <laughs> Jesus said be present with me while I am here. He also said, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. Let's make sure that we care with compassion for those who are less fortunate, who are unfortunate, or who are fortunate in different ways, maybe. Jesus enters into his week of going into Jerusalem, but before he goes and spends his time in busyness, he allows for a moment of worship. And let's be clear, this is not one of the 12 disciples, this group of men. This is not one of the Pharisees. This is a woman who had so little standing in her social system that she had to live with her brother. She didn't have a husband that we know of. She didn't have any other connection to power. And yet she is the one in this story who gets it right. One last thing I would say, though I may have already gone past brevity being the soul of wit at this point. By the way, Shakespeare wrote brevity is the soul of wit, so let us be brief. But I want you to think about how many words Shakespeare wrote. <laughs> <laughs> When I was an undergrad, I took both the Shakespeare classes at the same time because I am dumb, but also <laughs> because that's just what my schedule. And the Norton Anthology of Shakespearean Literature is this thick. It's great at killing spiders. <laughs> at the end of this story, one of the things I love in the irony of this cycle of Lazarus and Mary and Martha that happens in John's Gospel, 
is that Jesus has just brought Lazarus back from the dead, and now he is lounging with Lazarus. He is being worshipped by Mary. He's not condemning Martha for the service she is giving. In fact, Jesus is condemning no one in this story. Even, even Judas, he doesn't condemn. He just says, no, you're focused on the wrong thing. Lazarus had just been brought back from the dead, and if you read carefully, now they're ready to kill him. Because people who are truly alive in the presence of Christ, who are willing to offer our lives as fragrant worship to our Redeemer, sometimes that means people are going to want to get rid of us. Following Jesus in authenticity and in vulnerability and intentionality does not mean safety and security. It means a life worth living. A life that is full of purpose and fragrance that is pleasing to God. And my prayer for all of us, for all of Abilene, as we enter this week and as we enter every day, is that we may form our lives in such a way that God is glorified and that when Jesus is in our midst, we stop our busyness and pay attention. Amen. Give the chance to stand and sing together again. Lift high the cross.
Thank you all for being here today. We want to invite you back tomorrow at Highland Church of Christ, where we will be hearing from Benji Van Fleet from St. Paul. We hope that you'll join us again beginning at 1145. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may our worship be a fragrant offering to God as we serve the poor and sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen.